Thank you for that introduction. I am honored to be one of your keynote speakers. One of my goals in this talk is to cause your fears of the future to flee based on sound spiritual science that leads us to discover the needed counterbalances for our technological age. In my presentation, I intend to describe for you the dangers we face from technology, the iron necessity of a technological future, and to describe key counterbalances that we need to develop, and in particular, something Rudolf Steiner called refined breathing. Our conference theme, Dancing with Polarities, will attempt to grasp how the human is a kind of balance between nature and technology. Would we be right if we put the labels good and evil to these? Are we culturally prepared for a time when 90% of the potential workforce is unemployed because robots and AI bots have replaced them? The answer to both of these is no. From the perspective of spiritual science, we can elaborate on nature by describing how the four ethers work within it. We should be clear that it is beings, elemental beings, that are active in these ethers and in nature. But what about technology? We can also elaborate on technology by describing how fire was given to humanity by Prometheus. And through that, we found how to use electricity in magnetism, as well as perhaps a third force that was unknown in Steiner's time and that some have surmised. It is what we call nuclear energy. Again, other elemental beings are active here too, in what can be called subnature. We could simplify this by saying that our conference is about the balance between the living and the lifeless. Freemasonry has led to the mastering of the lifeless. In the future, we shall also master the living. But to attain knowledge of the living, we must first attain supersensible knowledge. Today, we might even see ourselves as the balance between the supersensible and the subsensible, or between superphysical and subphysical, or between supernature and subnature. All of these expressions were used by Steiner in the course of his lectures. The fully human is to be a balance between light and dark in thinking, warmth and cold in feeling, life and death in willing. With Christ's help, we learn to hold this balance between Lucifer and Araman. We thereby come to see Lucifer and Araman not as evil, but as part of a trinity with Christ that is serving the evolution of humanity. I listed here three interpenetrations. To these, humanity must add another, the interpenetration of the moral and the mechanical. More on this later. Here you see in blue, the intended path of our evolution. Had we followed it, we would have been beings that circled around the earth. But because of Lucifer in Eden, we fell to the black curve. Now we are approaching, and it has already begun, when we, out of freedom, decide our future. Our freedom will lead us to make a choice to follow the path of Christ in an etheric existence or to remain with the physical. Those who remain will then experience a second fall. This second fall will come when our aramonic double will have gained control of what's left of our physical body. 
those who have not yet overcome materialism and thereby remain closely connected to their physical body for their experience of reality will fall with their aramonic double. During future epochs, there will be opportunities for those who fell to be saved. Understanding our past can help us prepare for our future. Our time of being able, of accepting all that God gives us and desiring nothing more, is over. In the spirit of Cain, it becomes our task to spiritualize the earth. But part of our soul still longs for oneness with nature. Our soul gesture today is dominated by Cain. Yet evolution expects us to become the balance of Cain and Abel, that is, to be the offspring of Hiram Abiff, the builder of Solomon's temple. Hiram was later Lazarus, who was the first to be initiated by the Christ. What should be the temple that we are to build now? Is it to be a physical temple? or a temple built in the etheric, the living. Now comes an important question. How much of virtual reality is actually an attempt to create an image of the etheric? If this is the goal of virtual, virtual reality, then what's missing? The living, of course. We need spiritual science to give us knowledge of the living. With spiritual science, we, well, now put it as a question, can we create a technology that works by using the living just as today's technology works by using the lifeless? From where we stand today, the future does indeed look grim. When we look at possible futures depicted in modern movies, we feel a dread in our souls about putting humans, as we are currently constituted, in charge of creation. We know all too well how easily we give in to temptations, how weak we are in moral fortitude. Maybe we should go back to a simpler lifestyle without technology. If we did, we would be giving up our potential to become the 10th hierarchy. So we must face this question. Is it possible to evolve with technology in a healthy and meaningful way? What is the role, the cosmic role for technology in our human and earthly evolution? What is your picture of a desirable future? What kind of earth would you want to find when you reincarnate? Perhaps you envision a new Jerusalem. Do you hope that we will be closer to nature or enjoy a comfortable Jetson style life? For that, we would need to learn how to turn stones into bread. Or is a matrix like future inevitable. Which of these pictures does Araman prefer? And which suits the divine spiritual beings of our origin? Are you sure? Could our desired picture be colored by our sympathies and antipathies and by fear? Steiner spoke his picture of the future as iron necessity. What must we go through in our evolution, even if undesired, to fully attain our cosmic goal? As spiritual scientists, we must be cognizant not only of what has become, but also what is becoming. From Rudolf Steiner's words at the laying of the foundation stone for the original Gertianum, we must bear within us the consciousness of looking into far 
far cycles of time in order to become aware of how the mission of which this building is to be an emblem will take its place in the great mission of humanity upon our planet Earth, end quote. Thus, we must know the future in order to properly enact today's deeds. To be Michaelically active in the present is to be aware of the future. The future has always been fraught with dangers throughout all the epics. Once we've overcome a danger, we become comfortable with a new state of evolution. But the spiritual world continues to give us new challenges so that we emerge not as stunted angels, but as beings with strength, beauty, and truth. If a good God made this world, why are there such dangers? As Old Moon was beginning, God instructed some of the dynamis to become beings of hindrances. Even what we call evil must be seen as serving the good. As spiritual scientists, we need to prepare humanity. Well, I should say, we need to prepare for humanity the counterbalances that prevent the hindrances from steering us away from our divine goal. Each of you could list multiple dangers that we currently face. I will mention a few. First, the vacuum of the combustion engine. For this drove Yahweh from the air and subsequently allowed our ammonic beings to enter such machines. Vacuums are now ubiquitous in manufacturing processes used in technologies products that allow for the embodiment of demonic beings. It should be added that this occurred in evolution exactly when it should. Similarly, electricity was discovered right on time. Electricity was intended to be the carrier of death, and it is. But arriving at the wrong concept of electricity, we have rendered it into also being a carrier of evil. This does not mean we should avoid electricity. We can and will restore it to its rightful role. When we put electricity into the air, for example, 5G, we put death forces into the air. What are the consequences? Some 4,000 years ago, yoga used breathing because with each breath we breathed in divine spiritual beings. Today, the air we breathe carries death forces, and this is appropriate for our current stage of evolution. Mikhail is the time spirit who urges us to find courage and to overcome nationalism, genderism, racism. He calls for cosmopolitanism. Hmm. Can you consider social media to be a tool that leads towards attaining cosmopolitanism? Money plays a huge role in what comes naturally from the West. In the early days of Google and Facebook, they made very little money. But the monetization of search and of social media changed this landscape. By capturing data that advertisers could use for targeted sales, much higher return on investment became possible for sellers. Modern technology has also led to some governments implementing a kind of social credit system to reward good behavior and to punish what it deems as bad. Just 
when we've grown comfortable with Zoom, now we face the metaverse. Will we eventually become comfortable with virtual reality and augmented reality? In that near future, with Siri or Alexa by your side, she will be telling you who you are meeting and suggesting how you should behave. As evolution progresses and a time comes when we spend more time in virtual reality represented by our avatar, will another human that we meet in virtual reality be able to sense your ego through your avatar? Humanity is crossing the threshold. This is dangerous. When Dr. Kylan, a medical doctor and research scientist, asked Rudolf Steiner why there was such a rapid increase of heart problems, Steiner explained it with the fact that the etheric heart is loosening from the physical. So, shouldn't we try to stop this loosening of the etheric? No, for this is exactly what the future needs the loosening of the etheric body from the physical. In fact, with every anthroposophical meditation we do, we are loosening our etheric body. The result may lead to clairvoyance, but it certainly will lead to a withering of the physical body. Many might say, everything is too scary. I'm going to be safe and stay just as I am. To this, Steiner said, no more evil advice could be given than to say, stay just as you are. Everyone is obliged to undergo the battle. In its effects, it is experienced by everybody. There would be no greater fallacy than to say, we must rebel against what technical science has brought to us in modern life. We must protect ourselves from Araman. We must withdraw from this modern life. In a certain respect, such an attitude would be an indication of spiritual cowardice. The real remedy lies not in allowing the forces of the soul to weaken and to withdraw from modern life, but in so strengthening these forces that its pandemonium can be endured. World karma demands a courageous attitude to modern life. And that is why genuine spiritual science calls at the very outset for effort, really strenuous effort on the part of the human soul. We need to find ways to strengthen our souls for what's now, but more so for what's coming in the future. The beings of hindrances are here to help us become strong, but most people would rather remain in their recliner than to do the work to strengthen their soul. Steiner called this a form of arrogance. One example he gave was when someone says to himself or herself, I must guard against exposing my own body to these destructive forces. I must strictly protect myself from all the influences of modern life, such as 5G. I must retire into a sanctum with the right surroundings and walls painted and suitable colors for my spiritual sensitivity so that none of these adjuncts of modern life may come in contact with my bodily constitution, end quote, of the person saying that. So Steiner continues, the last thing I, this is Rudolf Steiner speaking, the last thing I want is that with the dangers I have mentioned that it should have this kind of effect on you. All desire to withdraw to protect oneself from the influences of unavoidable world karma emanates from weakness. 
although it is understandable that weaker natures would like to withdraw from modern life into communities where they will be untouched by it, it must nevertheless be emphasized that such an attitude is not the outcome of strength, but of weakness of the soul. Our real task is to strengthen the soul by permeating it with the impulses that come from spiritual science so that each is armed against the influences of modern life and can hold its own in spite of all the surrounding hubbub and be able to find its way into the spiritual divine world through the tumult and din of our harmonic beings. Since the 15th century, great changes have been happening, even in the spiritual world. Spiritual beings are ascending. Mikael has recently ascended. He will no longer return to be an archangel. We too are changing. Today, each of us is now a creator, albeit an infantile creator. Each of us has a longing in our soul to exercise this creativeness. Will the march of technology free us from necessary labor upon the physical realm so that each of us will have more time to be creative? Or will we use our expanding free time to watch more mindless entertainment on television. The battle of our times in the near future is a battle for human willing. On April 11, 1912, while in Helsinki, Rudolf Steiner said this, if nothing but old impulses were to operate, the only future in sight would be one in which technology would not only dominate the whole of our external life, but would overpower and paralyze us, driving out from the human soul anything of a religious, scientific, philosophical, and artistic, and even of an ethical nature in the higher sense. Without fresh spiritual impulses, humans will turn into something like living automatons, end quote. Living automatons? 1912. Many of us can foresee that possibility is now very near to being realized. He goes on to characterize our responsibility to develop spiritual science as a counterbalance for all of humanity. Only through fresh spiritual impulses will we make a path for our future, a path where we can practice creative work, and hence this conference. Responsibility. Yes, the spiritual world needs you. To the question of challenges towards meeting our evolutionary goals, Steiner offered these words. We have to realize that we must not shrink from such trials for every new configuration of the world which is presented to us furnishes us with new ordeals to be overcome. To come to an end of these trials would mean the death of true spiritual life. We have to recognize that we should not shrink from the trials because they make us strong, strong to rise up into the spiritual world. Let me offer a few quotes from Rudolf Steiner about the iron necessity of our future with technology. In such situations, the will is there to harness human energy to mechanical energy. These things should not be treated by fighting against them. That is a completely false view. These things will not fail to appear. They will come. 
What we are concerned with is whether in the course of world history, they are entrusted to people who are familiar in a selfless way with the great aims of earthly evolution and who structure these things for the health of human beings, or whether they are enacted by groups of human beings who exploit these things in an egotistical or in a group egotistical sense. That is what matters, end quote. Now, I'll like to make a comment here. What I just read is the reason for mystech, why it, it, it exists. Now, back to Steiner. It is not a question of the what in this case, the what is sure to come. It is a question of the how, how one tackles these situations. The what lies simply in the meaning of earthly evolution. The welding together of human nature with the mechanical nature will be a problem of great significance for the remainder of earthly evolution, end quote. One of the ways of welding meant by Steiner is that a specially tuned machine, such as a prosthetic limb, would respond to human vibrations. According to Steiner, such machines could be built that respond only to moral human vibrations. By the way, I hope you are beginning to feel the importance of the Greek god Hephaestus, who is the son of Zeus and Hera. We can ask, is it in our times that Hephaestus replaces Zeus as king of the gods? Keep in mind this welding together of man and machine in these timelines I will now show. In red, we see the start and end dates for the previous and coming post-Atlantean cultural ages, which are labeled PACA here. I've tried to indicate some approximately where some future events will occur. This future is not so far away. What we experience most strongly today are the preparations Araman is making for his coming incarnation in the flesh. I expect this about the year 2233, or soon after Mikael's reign as time spirit ends and Ariphiel's begins. It is the task of the anthroposophical movement, I'm quoting Steiner here, to prepare the sixth paka when brotherhood is to be realized. To do so, it must be cast aside the division into races and to bridge the divisions and differences between various groups of people. So we have to prepare the sixth epic, as the sixth paka, sorry. Now we move ahead in time. In green, I show the end of the fifth and the start of the sixth epic. Because there were no standards on the use of epic or of age, many English-speaking authors have confused these eschatological dates. Christ is now revealing <clears throat> our next stage in evolution when our lowest bodily member will be our etheric body. During the time of Philadelphia, sexual procreation will end. By 5,700, humans will no longer pass through puberty. We will still have an etheric heart, an etheric larynx, and all organs of an etheric body, but we will no longer have or need a physical body as given to us. Then, during the seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, we will need to rely upon the fallen spirits of darkness in order to keep our presence on the physical earth going. During this last age 
of the fifth epic, egoism will increase so much that it will result in a war of all against all, a war that brings about an end to this epic's civilization and even to our relationship to whatever that physical body is. During this seventh cultural age, some advanced human beings will be able to leave their physical body behind and move on to life in the etheric, while other humans will continue to embrace materialism and find foolishness in spiritual concepts. Thus, they will freely choose to remain with the physical. The aromatic double will take over abandoned physical bodies, but they will not be able to maintain its form that was given to us by the exousiae. This will become the second fall that I mentioned, a fall of both humans and aromatic doubles. These fallen ones will become spidery in their form and cover the earth. Soon after this catastrophe, the moon will physically return to reunite with the evolving and dying earth. Farther out in evolution, the dead earth falls to pieces, but from its seed, a new macrocosm will grow up. The apocalypse of St. John is an outline of the whole of evolution. You see depicted here the foreshadowing of the future planetary conditions called Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan during this fifth, then sixth, and the seventh epochs. During the Venus foreshadowing, or sixth epoch, evil must be overcome and driven into the abyss, that is, the fall of Babylon. The people who have been saved can develop themselves further toward a new state following the reunification with the sun. What has been cleansed and purified will arise for the Vulcan foreshadowing, that is the seventh epic. On May 20th, 1909, Steiner offered this to prepare us. Human beings today are already creative on the earth. In the distant future, everything that human beings now create will rise again. The place that humanity has prepared is called the New Jerusalem. A new world will descend to us and will be inhabitable by human beings who will have achieved the requisite state of maturity. If you want the creeps, this passage from Esoteric Lessons should spook you. A splitting of one's personality is inevitable by those faithfully doing anthroposophical exercises. One will begin to feel as if something was accompanying them something that thinks and hears with them and even speaks with them. It will be our aramonic double that emerges. The more seriously someone treads the esoteric path, the more this double appears. And the more the double appears, the better it is for our development. For otherwise, we would be living under great delusions about ourselves. The aromatic beings, are double, know of this future. To counteract it, they want for us to develop a strong love for the physical. They want for us to believe a heaven on earth is possible. In our laziness, we want a future where a utopia comes about within the physical. But the path of human evolution must leave the physical behind, as we heard. We leave our body behind for our aromatic double. Our desire for comforts can stymie any will for the spiritual. It is for us to learn how to go through 
death of the physical in order to ascend to life in the etheric. Christ is showing us the way. Like Prometheus, we must free ourselves from our chains to the physical realm. We are now at a time when human beings living on earth are strongly united with the earthly. Many now identify their ego with their body. However, in the seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, a good soul will need to live in a physical body that does evil. A good soul living in a body that does evil. At that future time, our relationship to the physical body will be similar to our relationship to our automobile. We enter it, do what was needed, and get out. Such a body will no longer experience birth, nor will it experience death. Like our car that runs over insects and animals and pollutes the air, this future body will also do evil. On the 28th of June, 1909, Steiner said, I am going to tell you, here's a quote, a truth which should be engraved in the human soul as a lofty moral maxim. <clears throat> when you see something evil in the world, do not say, here is evil. That is imperfection. <clears throat> Ask rather, how can I attain to the enlightenment which will show me that on a higher plane, this evil is transformed into good by the wisdom of the cosmos? How can I learn to tell myself, here you see not but imperfection because you are as yet unable to grasp the perfection of this imperfect thing. Whenever we see one or see evil, one should look into their own soul and ask, why am I not yet able to recognize the good in this evil that confronts me? You see, the real battle with evil must be seen as an inner battle. Luciferic and Aramonic spirits, spirits of darkness, have been cast down from heaven to earth to reside within human consciousness. Because of this, according to Steiner, human beings must be released from the earth, torn away from it, with part of their essential nature taken back into the spiritual world. Humanity must develop awareness of not being of this world, and this must grow stronger and stronger. In future, human beings must walk on this earth who say to themselves, yes, at birth I enter into a physical body, but this is a transitional stage. I really remain in the spiritual world. I am conscious that only part of my essential nature is united with the earth. Now that we've talked about the dangers and the goals of evolution, we come to the central point of this lecture, the counterbalances. It is a Rosicrucian gesture to live in the environment of modern times. To do so, Steiner spoke about the need to find appropriate counterbalances. I will highlight just some important counterbalances. Steiner typically always mentions Christ as the key to all balancing. Spiritual science is itself a primary counterbalance, and you've heard some of these in quotes. For example, as we venture into subnature, so must we balance this by ascending into supernature. And an undeveloped counterbalance that I will describe for you shortly is refined breathing. 
let me take a moment to delve a bit deeper into some specific counterbalances for living in this technological age. We are called upon to practice spirit awareness. There are practices we can do that exercise our experience of the etheric, of supernature. As we've heard, however, such exercises will loosen one's etheric body from one's physical, causing the physical to wither. Now, first and foremost, movement, for we sit or stand in front of our screens far too much. So walk every day at the same time for an hour or more. Do your with me, even if online. Sing in a choir. Do gardening, something more than merely looking at nature. Get your hands dirty. And five, engage in sports and outdoor play. And children, this is wonderful for them, and they need at least two hours a day, especially in the winter months. And if you are often working in front of a computer screen, then I set just every 20 minutes, look out a window at nature that is at least 20 meters away and look for at least 20 seconds before returning to your screen. Now, I will describe for you what Steiner called refined breathing. Let's ponder these words from Genesis. Yahweh breathed breath into man, and he became a living soul. The word Yahweh means, according to Steiner, the blowing one. With Yahweh's exhalation within us, we became sentient. Humanity evolved at this moment from a plant-like existence to a being with a soul, a soul that could then develop thinking. Then thinking itself evolved. In this first age, humans thought in the realm of the ego where we perceive spiritual beings. Later, thinking descended to the astral realm where we were inspired by spiritual beings. Later still, thinking descended to the etheric, where we were given imaginations by spiritual beings. In the 15th century, thinking arrived at the dead physical, enabling dead thinking. Now the time has come for thinking and for breathing to ascend. Steps of ascension are steps into the supersensible, such steps counterbalance our sliding into subnature. Next, I want to enlarge on this relationship of thinking and breathing with the words from Steiner that go like this. The lung is an organ that also has forces of head formation within it, though to a lesser degree. The whole human organism has everywhere these same forces, but in varying intensities. The head is an advanced respiratory organ. Having moved beyond the lung stage, it represses breathing of air, and instead of taking in air, takes in etheric forces through the senses. Steiner's anthroposophy begins with thinking with the philosophy of freedom, and then progresses to this refined breathing, or the breathing of the ethers. Breathing is a closed cycle. Internally, our in-breath mixes with blue blood in our lungs, turning the blood red with oxygen. Outside, this oxygen was dead, but now inside, now in the blood, it is etherized with the blood and as such becomes living oxygen. We exhale moisture with the inside air that now contains higher amounts of carbon dioxide. Our exhalation completes a cycle with the plant kingdom that takes or I should say inhales CO2 and exhales oxygen. Obviously, without the sun's light, there would be no plant life. But what are these sun rays? Are they more than light from the sun? 
I'll answer this in a moment. Steiner called refined breathing the new yoga. To make this clearer, I'd like to use some diagrams that Steiner offered in lecture six of the mission of the Archangel Mikael. The first post-Atlantean cultural age was the Indian, represented by a circle to indicate oneness. Only the spiritual part of the human being was considered real. The physical was Maya, illusion. For the Persian cultural age, we draw an ellipse that has two centers, the heavenly and the earthly, or light and dark. Next, the Egyptian cultural age would be a lemniscate showing the microcosm and the macrocosm. Breathing air brought outer through the crossing point into the inner, the macrocosm into the microcosm. This would be when yoga was being practiced. Later came the Greek and Roman cultural age when a balance of the bodily and the heavenly was attained. Well, at least at the start of that age. But then the physical outweighed the heavenly and inner and outer separated. Materialism set in. The ego could then develop within the environment where the separation of self from world was perceived. Kali Yuga then reached its darkest time. With the ending of Kali Yuga in 1879, the potential to work again with the etheric body presented itself as the etheric loosens within the physical. It has become possible in our time to reconnect what was split, to make a new lemniscate for the ascent. Steiner drew a diagram somewhat like this one, where he pointed out how in the times before the mystery of Golgotha, the counterbalance to Lucifer's influence was found in the ensouled air, in rhythmical breathing of that ensouled air, in order to balance the thinking received from Lucifer. With the mystery of Golgotha, this began to change. The air became merely air. Then Araman replaced Lucifer as the dominant force in what one met with their available senses. Now to balance Araman in our willing, we need to develop a new yoga based on where we can once again find insolment. Today, that is in breathing the light, the light ether. By light, Steiner meant what we receive through the physical senses, what is breathed in through the senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Steiner called all of it light ether. On old moon, beings breathed fire instead of air. Just as we breathe oxygen in and out, so they breathed fire in and out. Just as no human today breathes fire, so future men will no longer breathe air. It will be light, end quote. The most important thing today is the spirit that one puts into their exhaled breath. The spirit is built up by our thoughts. Remember, you are now creators. This spirit streams out with our exhalation. Why is this so important? The sum of our moral exhalations becomes the foundation for the forming of the beings of Jupiter. I should say the forming of the bodies of the beings of Jupiter. A clairvoyant can see in one's exhalation the morality present within that person. What we exhale is the result of our inner work. What is exhaled is full of vapor, a watery element placed there by one's etheric body. In the future, 
all will be able to see another's morality in their breath. When we breathe air, the astral body directs our inhalation and the etheric body directs our exhalation. With refined breathing, our inhalation consists of the four ethers. What's in the outer is taken to the inner. These are warm, light, the chemical or tone ether, and life ethers. Now, from the four ethers inhaled, what do we exhale with this refined breathing? What goes from our inner to the outer? We find the answer in the first class lessons. Here we learn that the light ether is taken up by our thinking. Then we exhale dead thoughts. These dead thoughts are inhaled by the third hierarchy, that is angels, archangels, and archai. Then they enliven these once dead thoughts and exhale living thoughts to the second hierarchy, who in turn inhale these living thoughts and exhale cosmic thoughts woven in love. What they exhale is what the rays from the sun and the stars are. The beings and plants of the earth then take in these rays, thereby completing this cycle. Today, refined breathing is only an indication from Steiner. It needs much work by us to bring it to the state of truly being the new yoga. Let me mention again the additional important theme of the interpenetration of moral and mechanical. This is a task of our cultural age. It is important to us it is, and it's important to use the verb interpenetrate and not penetrate. This is not the moral penetrating the mechanical, nor the good overcoming the evil. Rather, this is the interpenetration. Interpenetration is something of great importance for the next planetary condition, Jupiter. Just as there was an interpenetration of light and dark resulting in colors, so shall there be an interpenetration of the moral and the mechanical. In this presentation, we have learned that bemoaning technology comes from spiritual weakness. Rather, we need to face technology with soul strength and find the appropriate counterbalances for all of humanity. We looked at dangers that we face from Araman's incarnation that is coming soon. Araman is busy with his preparations. We too should be busy with our preparations. We surveyed the path of evolution as iron necessity. In GA 135, Steiner said, what is destined to happen in the course of evolution will happen no matter what powers rise up against it, end quote. As such, there must be a welding together of man and machine, and that this has already begun and will continue. And concepts of transhumanism will be realized when evolution reaches the seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, when we will need to be able to turn stones into bread. We looked at some counterbalances. I mentioned how the theme of this conference places mankind as the balance between the living and the lifeless. Just as we have mastered the mineral kingdom, the lifeless, so shall we come to master in the near future, the living, the plant kingdom, the etheric. We learned that the path of technology is sliding us into subnature. We must balance this with conscious steps into supernature. Lastly, we looked at Steiner's great gift to our times, namely refined breathing. For our ascension, we will need to develop this new yoga. Just as yoga modified the breathing of air, 
so shall this involve a modification of the inhalation of the four ethers and the exhalation of moral thoughts. For these will become the building blocks for the beings who will be upon the human stage of Jupiter. Just as we entered upon the human stage of old moon and created quite a nuisance for those beings who are now our guardian angels, so are these future Jupiter humans now among us, not physically, but similarly being a nuisance to us. As wisdom was poured into what became earth, so shall love be poured by us into what is to become Jupiter. We heard that an, an important task for humanity in this cultural age as preparation for this future is the interpenetration of the moral and the mechanical. This is a human task and something which requires us to dive into Araman's realm, knowing that one has Christ as one's companion in order to bring about this interpenetration. As the individual Hiram or Lazarus or John once learned what agape love is, so shall we. Today, our old brain-bound thinking operates with the forces of death. From Steiner's letters to members, he wrote, quote, the age of Mikael has dawned. Hearts are beginning to have thoughts. In this age, each of us becomes capable of living thinking. Mikael shows us the way from natural science to spiritual science, a way that is not easy, that requires strenuous effort and willed living thinking. Through Peter, the foundation of the church in the lifeless was laid. Now has come the time of Johannian Christianity. With this warmth and love, the earth and even technology can be Christianized. I hope by now you have realized that when we speak of world evolution, we must realize we are destined not only to strive into supernature, but also to slide into subnature. This will enable the future redemption of Araman. I'd like to close with a snippet from the second stanza of the Foundation Stone Meditation. Practice spirit sensing in balance of the soul, where the surging deeds of world evolution unite your own eye with the eye of the world, and you will truly feel in human souls creating. Thank you for your attention. Now we can take your questions.